pierwsza Lady Ukrainy, Olena Zelenska. Okay. Okay. This will be in Ukrainian. Tak. Um, vi, pani Oleno, duże Dear Olena, you are quite a busy person. Um, you've just through with the international summit, the summit of first ladies and gentlemen, dedicated to mental health and rehabilitation. Uh, would you please provide us with more details about the summit, practical aspects of it, who you were able to invite and involve this year. I do know that last year you were able to collect almost 6 million euro uh, uh, door to buy nearly 100 of ambulances. What have been the practical results of this year's summit? Uh, thank you so much. I'd like to thank again for making it uh, for me to meet you here, dear professor, on this stage, because you're a much busier person than I am. And I'm deeply thankful to you for this conversation, for this chance of being with you. And yes, we had the third summit of first ladies and gentlemen uh, three years ago, and we were able to retain the leadership. And this is the format already established in Ukraine, which will keep going. And in spite of war and security dangers, we are still inviting and having people. We've increased the number of our or my colleagues, actually. Finally, we were able to uh, ensure gender equality. We had three first ladies and three first gentlemen. Uh, regarding the results of the previous year, yeah, it was some sound practical results with ambulances. Uh, this year, we had 25 memorandums on medical partnerships signed between hospitals, clinical centers in Ukraine and their peers. Uh, from across the world, it will provide some practical assistance to the health system in Ukraine heavily affected by the Russian aggression. It won't be just about experience exchange. It will be about in-person meetings of foreign professionals coming out to Ukraine to the surgeries. It will be about assistance with equipment, joint research work, hopefully even publications in medical sources. So it's quite a ramified cooperation. And like yeah, they have people to people operation formula, this time it will be about clinic to clinic modus. And hopefully it will outlive the war, this horrible war. Well, I can talk for long about the summit, but probably let's turn to the topic of it. I'm extremely glad that we've been able to bring the topic of mental health in Ukraine to the top of the list. This is quite relevant for the world as well. We were able to present the results of the research made by Alligators Digital from the UK to assess the self-assessment by people across the world of their mental health. The geography was ample from Japan to Argentina. And interestingly, nearly every second person worldwide has been perceiving some repercussions of the war in Ukraine. Interesting and horrible. On the one hand, this is about empathy and people's connection to what's happening to us. Okay, 
Every war is about life and death. My impression is that this war, we've reached the topmost or the deepest meaning of life and death. In Ukraine, both among relatives, with soldiers, I am uh, hearing quite often words like life, love, happiness. Now, uh, could you share your key insights after the discussions you had at the forum? The <laughs> after the discussions on mental health, uh, I think we uh, opened the big topic of Ukrainian resilience for the world. And the things you have just mentioned, these are the things that keep us afloat, keep us together. Throughout these horrible months, we try to research the secrets of Ukrainian resilience because we do know it exists. And the whole world watches it and feels it. But what it is all about, we are sure that this is about our joint shared values. Like I mentioned, love to each other towards the motherland in many respects it goes back with its root into our history our culture the arts created by ukrainians i think we have understood it even better that such resilience can be only nurtured through looking deeper into yourself into your own history or recalling and developing your own culture. This is among the key insights I would like to mention. One of the panels was dedicated to the youth, young people. They will be making decisions and living their lives in this country afterwards. We are very glad that this is no longer a taboo topic for them like uh, the grandparents used to have. Lots of challenges have been linked to digitalization. Really many more young people are spending their time in social networks and social media versus elderly people, which is uh, somewhat dangerous. But on the other hand, it's a way for them to communicate, to socialize at the time when everyone perceives, you know, solitary. This is a real help. We had a very nice, bright girl. She became uh, a colleague of Stephen Fry. Uh, she's fif 15. She, her name is Katya, and I think she's a growing star. Uh, among the anchor women. She really, she's phenomenal. One of the secrets she shared with us is we, the young people, we do know what we can take from social networks. I am learning English, and because of that, lots of my social networks are linked to English. Uh, they're targeting us. If you look for funny picture cats, this is uh, what you'll be seeing all the time. But you can choose for important, useful, nice topics, and then you will get uh, something positive and useful from that. Another insight is that we have to learn from the young people. We have to watch them. And, uh, you know, they're more, more bold. They're smarter than us. Thank God. Maybe a couple of words more about the all uh, Ukrainian program. How are you? Uh, yeah, right. I can tell you that this program started almost immediately after the beginning of the full-scale invasion. 
when we started getting those first horrible feelings after Bucha, Irpin, Mariupol, when we understood that uh, uh, in a wider sense the psychological mental health of Ukraine is in danger. This is where the program kicked off. Now it's being developed. We try to enhance each of uh, its uh, operational facets. It's about services, about uh, medical assistance uh, in the area of mental health, about various categories and groups from kids to adolescents to adults to elderly people because each of the groups requires some specific approach, tailored one. Uh, we also include the, our servicemen, the veterans, those who were wounded or traumatized by the war. Uh, what we've uh, identified early on, we found this problem of uh, social stigmatization of the topic. You, we may create lots of services, but when an individual does not understand he or she is in need of assistance, and does not understand the importance of such assistance, then definitely it will be shunned and unfortunately, there is still a popular idea of strong people being above that, about strong people who should be able to cope with the problems themselves. If you feel tired, exhausted, scared, then, well, then you are simply covered. Still lots of patterns like that across our society that many times in many uh, circumstances prevent one from seriously considering his or her mental health. Through the research, we came to a better understanding of why people avoid talking openly about their mental conditions, about potential problems they may run into. First of all, people don't want to disappoint the next of kin, family members. They fear that if I tell them I'm not OK, then they will not be OK as well. Uh, on the job, people may be scared of uh, losing their job, uh, being again avoided. People are afraid of being diagnosed with some mental disease, though uh, the number of people, the percentage of them really being diagnosed with that is negligibly small. People still remember the sad and unfortunate lessons uh, from the Soviet past uh, with mental health institutions from there. From here, the need to overcome this range of problems. From here, the need to have wide dialogues like, like we have had on international platforms here at this summit to make this topic more prominent, more important. Also, this is uh, a topic which is important for the whole of the world. Mental health has no borders. Everyone needs to understand that caring after him or herself is not about being egotistic. It's about being responsible. Responsibility. If you have no resource to lead a normal life, it means you have no such resource available for your family, for the public, and this may lead to some dangerous uh, aftermaths. All of our talks about mental health regularly start with some horrible prognosis of what may happen if not, how it will affect the economy, uh, what can happen if uh, the problem is not dealt early on, what type of mental problems may develop, but uh, we see that uh, the more we talk about that, uh, really provides an avenue uh, for ways to elim eliminate these problems, or at least mitigate them. It seems to me it's my turn now, right? Is it not? Thank you. Go ahead. 
I've just been mentioning the resilience of the Ukrainian people, and I can't but ask you, Mr. Professor, as a historian that you are, we get to see a lot of things in our um, history, in the roots that this history stems from. And it's true that one of the kinds of therapy for us is studying our own history. And for me, likewise, I'm not an exception to that. That's why I'm watching some of your videos with your lectures about the history of Ukraine. Thank you very much indeed, by the way, for this, for this contribution of yours. They are enjoying millions of views, and your students in particular, uh, people from overseas, local people here in Ukraine, they do take interest in Ukrainian history. We understand why our history is aching to us, but my question is why is the Ukrainian history interesting to foreign people? And what are the most frequent, uh, frequent questions that they ask you? Thank you very much for your question. It seems to me that the Ukrainian history is interesting also for Ukrainians themselves. I'm under the impression that we right now are living through the moment of the recovery of the Ukrainian culture as well as the Ukrainian history. Up until now, a lot of narratives have been lacking. Something that should be proper, coherent, and attractive. And we definitely lack that. And a lot of Ukrainians, not only Americans, we're watching, have been watching all of these uh, lectures. When we go talk about Americans, for example, it's very difficult to explain because Americans, for Americans, the Ukrainian history is interesting or perhaps fascinating even, not because it is Ukrainian at all, but mostly because the Ukrainian history um, can present you with actually everything, both Europe, wars, insurrections, rebellions, literature, poetry. My students, the way they have the perspective on the Ukrainian history, they get to see the whole world. And it seems to me it can also become important. This can be communicated in such a way that people get to understand the linkages and connections between different uh, different episodes of the Ukrainian history and the history of the whole world. Thank you very much indeed. I will still be consulting my notes, if you don't mind. My next question is also about history. I do understand that for you as a historian, a year is not essential, is not a substantial amount of time. Historical science works with centuries, it operates decades at least, millennia sometimes, but we saw each other a year ago. And um, from your point of view, what shifts are significant for the Ukrainian history that have taken place during this year? What has changed here in Ukraine? which will propel the history of Ukraine to um, move along some lines, what will give it a particular kind of direction. First of all, I would like to say that this has been a year of way too many experiences, way too much everything. So it will take a lot of many years to consolidate and understand what has happened to you during this year. And this history will remain with you, but it still strikes me that Ukrainians during this year have come to understand it much better that you have different experiences, narratives, 
that you are true partners in conversations about what is most important in this world. And at the level of the whole Ukraine, it's also evident. It seems to me the language has changed. The language has changed. More people these days are speaking Ukrainian rather than Russian. This is evident, and it goes without saying. When I was in Kiev 25 years ago, this was absolutely different, stark different. And I could never speak Russian in Kiev. I would always speak Ukrainian. And even 25 people, 25 years ago, people's reactions were very much different from what they are today. However, for me, the most the most interesting thing is when I have a seat in a cafe and young people are walking by, and I can hear the sound bites of them speaking Ukrainian, and this is so fine, so good. And another thing, there is a consolidation of the Ukrainian society, it's evident. Along with that, this, this is something that needs to be reminded that a lot of Ukrainians who are staying outside Ukraine, there's a great variety of experiences here in Ukraine. But this historic year is really significant, not only for Ukraine, but for the rest of the world. Something that is happening in Ukraine right now is just as important and essential for the whole Europe. That's something that we cannot fathom, but it's true. Thanks a lot. My next question is somewhat more of political or geopolitical in nature, but it's still extremely important for Ukraine, and we would like to get your thoughts on it and your advice. Right, right now, Ukraine is waging its fight for truth as well as for the influence and impact to be exerted on the countries of the global south. Unfortunately, for many decades, this geographic part of uh, the map, for some reason, fell out of the uh, scope of our interests. I don't know why, but could you kindly advise us from historic perspective, what could help us in this fight? What kind of statements do we have to use and uh, utilize in order to engage in this dialogue with the Global South? Well, it's a very tricky and a complicated question indeed for an American. Because if we, as Americans, had answers to this question, then our relations with the so-called global south would be very different from what this relationship is right now. So it seems to me that it goes about a concept in the first place. First and foremost, it goes about human experience. This will be really hard and arduous because at this point, Ukrainians, what they want, I mean, it's natural. They want to be heard. They want what's happening here in Ukraine to resonate with the rest of the world. It's true. But if Ukrainians wanted people in Nicaragua, Bolivia, or Cuba to understand Ukraine, you have to understand something about their histories here in Ukraine, because there can be no full, complete understanding on one side without uh, the complete understanding of the other side. This will not be an easy path for you to undertake, but I don't think there is another pathway to move along. I think this is the way it should be done. You have to listen to your counterparts, the opposite end. And another bit of attention needs to be given to a great variety, diversity, 
because once again there is no single solid global south there's a great variety of different nations representing them and my practical tip and um, Ms. Natalia Gumenyuk is doing that and I know many others they're doing it just like about the people in Ukraine they explain it to these common people, they look at the history, at what's happening right now, the latest developments. These people will be watching what is happening in Ukraine and they will have their own perception. Thank you very much for mentioning Natalia Gumenyu. She's already brought a delegation from South America to Ukraine and a delegation from Africa, and I thank her very much indeed for that. Because this enables her to know more about us, and we also have to perfect our knowledge and make our knowledge about those nations more in-depth. Because you're right. You will never evoke any interest unless you are interested in your opposite end. So thanks a lot for this advice. I suppose right now it's your turn to ask me questions, isn't it? Perhaps, it's very well maybe. <laughs> Just because we are speaking about this year, we haven't seen a year. Well, I did get to see you. I also got to see you sporadically and also got to read your book. It's so horrific but inspiring at the same time. Thank you very much for the path to unfreedom. But if I may, in answer to the question, I would like to hear um, the answer to the question, what has changed um, for you within this year, the way that you're working on your mental health, if I may ask you about that. Yes, you may. You know, just as we are sitting here, I'm so happy and so jolly that yes hasn't changed its location because it seems to me like we have been here a year and nothing has changed substantially. In fact, a lot of people get to say that we are as if frozen in time because while the war is still going on, we are in a kind of a state of permanent stress and depression along with elation and anticipating good news. And it's truly hard to maintain this balance because the stress burden for a long period of time is so exhausting. And I'm not an exception to that. There are some bits in time when I have to try to look for motivation for myself to keep believing in the best to come. And I will tell you outright that there are no universal approaches in this respect in, in terms of taking care of myself, something that I could advise for everyone to apply to themselves. But since this question is about me, I can tell you that something that helps me to clear up my thoughts when it's so bad, when I feel so beaten down, when the emotions really overwhelm me and I don't feel sober enough, physical exercise comes to my rescue. Every time this summit is a frightful stress, a piece of stress. I'm so anxious, I'm panic-stricken. When a thousand thoughts cross my mind how bad things can go about and I cannot just concentrate on practical preparation, at this point, physical exercise is a real rescue. Heavyweight lifting, cardio exercise is something that will definitely wear me out. So immediately all of the unnecessary thoughts fly out of my mind. I did it just like that this particular time and everything was calm and quiet, although my muscles, the whole of my body was sore. And uh, another thing that I should mention is that I'm being helped Digging into our own history and what's happening to humanity and what's happening in people's heads and why we are allowing this sort of violence in relation to each other and reading and perusing 
and watching some historical documentaries helps me structure my own emotions because otherwise they are too numerous to cope with them every day. However, I would like to reiterate that there are no unique tricks that make you healthy. I, for instance, cannot still solve my issue with the sleep, but I have taken the first two steps on the way to sleep. I bought a book about sleeping, and I have almost finished reading it. Now I have only to stick to the advice that neurophysiologists provide, and I do hope that I will cope with this problem as well. One final question. We are now enjoying life here, and we are happy, and we are talking about interesting topics. And I have quite a, here quite a lot of uh, questions from our foreign guests. We are admitting that we are suffering, that people are dying, that entire towns are being destroyed. However, in Kiev or Lviv, you have nightclubs. Odessa is uh, celebrating through the nights, and the beaches there are open. So for many people, this is a provocative and dis disputable question. How shall we explain this? So I wanted your advice. How do we present it in a correct way? I think that this is the sign of our resilience. As our economy, our political system, our backing system have withstood the onslaught, and we didn't have even such an inflation that could be there. And this is about our desire to continue to live. We did not want to begin this war. And you cannot ban people from celebrating life. This is also connected to resilience. However, maybe you will help me to find correct words for a foreign audience. What shall we tell them so that they understand? Yeah. Do they really have uh, the beaches open in Odessa? Um, you know, I was in Odessa, but I didn't swim in the sea, regrettably. So I understand. As I read this news from Americans, I am I become sad because. I then think this person must be a person who does not understand happiness or unhappiness. So I am sad then. However, on the other hand, it seems to me that such a reaction is a bit artificial and quite a uh, chunk of this message is propaganda, and this is ill will. However, for me, this is, on the other hand, a very interesting question, because this is rather absolutely normal. Life combines happiness and unhappiness. Yesterday, we heard how soldiers were talking about how it is very good when people are happy in Kiev, and this is about this. You have to find this normal balance, usual balance. However, I think that you should treat this issue positively, in a positive way. Do not react to this directly. However, think about this, how this war is, as Pauls used to say, about your, your, yours and ours freedom. And this is also about our happiness and your happiness. And this is absolutely normal. Thank you.
I am deeply grateful to you uh, for this conversation and also want to thank our defenders for the fact that we have the opportunity to talk about this and celebrate life in Kiev while they are fighting on the front.